Hi, I'm Carolyn Clava. I'm the Sauerland Conservancy Stewardship Program Coordinator, and today we are at Zion Crossing Park. We're going to do a stream assessment here. The other week we did an indoor session online with Anjali Thacker with the New Jersey Watershed Ambassador Program, and she's a Watershed Ambassador for WMA8. Today we're in WMA10 to do the stream assessment. Um, but we want to walk through in situ and do a stream assessment. We're not going to go through everything um, in detail because you really need two people to do this, and I'm by myself. But I'm just going to walk through the stream habitat assessment and macro or biological assessment sheet and kind of show you in the field what it looks like. So. Right here is our stream assessment, our habitat assessment sheet. I've already gotten it wet, so it's a little bit blurry. Um, but we're just gonna walk our way through this so that we can see in real life what it looks like. So our site ID is Zion Crossing. Um, our site name is Zion Crossing, and so is our site ID. Then our watershed management area, our WMA, is 10, and the county we are in is Somerset segment identification. So we're going to look at longitude and latitude and that's something you can look up on your GPS or on your phone. And your survey team. So today it's Carolyn and Karina is here with me and she's recording. And you're going to add your time. So right now it is 9.06 a.m. and we're going to put that on there. Um, and the date and today is July 2nd, 2020. Today's weather, absolutely beautiful. It is clear skies, a few clouds, but overall it's just stunning. I don't think you could ask for a better July day in the Sourlands. The next question is days since last rain, and that was yesterday. It rained quite a bit. Air temperature, I checked it in my car before I got here, and it is 83 degrees. You can also use um, local weather station, which is probably a little bit more accurate, um, which I'm going to just compare that to the weather that I saw on my uh, car thermometer. You need a uh, water temperature. And so we're going to provide everybody thermometers that are all calibrated. Uh, unfortunately, right now we can't go calibrate them because of the lockdown. Um, but there's a special place that you go with NJDEP and you calibrate all of your thermometers. So you can't just stick a regular thermometer in the ground. They have to be um, calibrated to make sure that we're getting accurate data. The next thing we're going to look at is water conditions. There's odor. So go ahead and take a big whiff. It smells great here. Um, but depending on where you are, it might not smell so great. So some of the options are normal, sewage, petroleum, chemical, or anaerobic. So that smells like rotten eggs. Um, and the water here smells wonderful, as in doesn't really smell like much of anything, but I do get a lot of the sense of the things that are blooming right now. Um, unfortunately, Japanese honeysuckle is blooming right now and it smells great. Um, so the next thing we're going to look at is turbidity and turbidity means what is the water looking like? Is it clear? Is it not clear? So really turbid water is going to be really hard to see through. And if you look down here, you can see that the water is perfectly clear. Um, so the water is clear. And so we circle that one. Surface coating. Um, so you're going to look for any oil slicks or foam on the stream and if you look around it's pretty great there's no surface coating um, so there's no oil slicks there's no foam there's nothing on the water it's beautiful um, so you just put none and stream flow is it slow moderate swift or combination and I'd say this is pretty slow maybe slow to moderate we see some ripples but overall um, probably slow. So the next thing we're going to look at stream measurements. Um, and what you do when you do your stream measurements is you're going to um, look at the width and the depth of the stream. 
And again, you really need two people to do this. Um, so we have a measuring tape here. And so one person would stand over on one stream bank and another person would bring the measuring tape over here and you'd measure how wide your stream is. And you're gonna do that three different times. Um, and I guess I should say the first thing you're gonna do is pick a hundred meter segment. So you would start downstream and doing these assessments walking upstream. Um, but you're gonna do your width and your depth three times. So you would make your transect across the stream and then take, um, excuse me, five measurements of width and depth along your 100 meter um, segment. And then the next thing you want to measure is velocity. So you're gonna take a rubber ducky or a ball, anything that floats. We have a ball. And so you're gonna measure the amount of time it takes this ball to float down um, 10 feet between you and your partner that you're measuring with. But again, because I'm by myself, I can't do this. And if I drop my ball in, uh, we're gonna lose it. So, but that's how you measure velocity of your stream is by measuring a distance between you and your partner. And as you drop the ball down, you start your timer and you time as long as it takes for the ball to reach your partner. The next thing that we're gonna look at is canopy. We wanna see is the canopy open, mostly open, partly open, and mostly closed. So in this part right here, I'd say it's mostly open. But if you look over a little bit farther downstream, it's mostly closed. Um, so when you take these measurements, again, you're gonna kind of categorize across your entire 100 meter stretch of, you know, is the canopy mostly open or mostly closed? Woody debris. So woody debris is important because a lot of our aquatic macroinvertebrates are gonna cling on to those woody debris. So if you look down in the stream, there are some branches there and up farther. You want to also look for predominant aquatic vegetation. So if you see any rooted emergent, rooted submergent, so rooted emergent means something that's a plant that's rooted underground and is coming up above the water. Rooted submergent is something that's rooted under the water and then doesn't break the water surface. Uh, rooted floating where it just floats on top of the surface, free floating or no vegetation. And really, we don't have any vegetation. So litter concentration, present absence. Um, I don't see any litter. And oh, there's one water bottle or soda bottle up there, uh, which we'll take with us. <laughs> um, if you're out here doing a stream assessment, please feel free to clean up if you see anything. Other than that, this looks really pristine and beautiful. The next thing we're gonna look at is structures. None, bridges, culverts, dams, or others. So we see a bridge over there, so that's something that we're gonna check off. And land use characteristics. So are there any agricultural feedlots? No. Athletic fields? No. Camping? No. Cemetery? No. Commercial construction, cropland, no. Dumpling, no. Golfing, no. Hiking, yes. There's a really great hiking trail here. It's short and sweet, but it's beautiful. Okay. Inactive fields, industrial plants, livestock use, no. Maintained lawns. I can't see any maintained lawns from where we are. Um, I know that there are some a little bit further up but not anywhere near here. Marinas, definitely not. Mines and quarries, nope. Orchards, nope. Parking lots, there is a parking lot for Zion. Crossing Park right over there. Pasture, no. Preserved open space, yes. 
Recycling waste facilities? Nope. Residences? Yes. Residential pets and pet waste? I haven't seen any, um, but I wouldn't be surprised. Roads paved? Yes. Roads unpaved? Yes. Sewage treatment? Nope. Stormwater basin? No. Swimming? No. Fishing? Yes. Waterfowl? I haven't seen any. And wetlands? Um, I'm not sure if this area is characterized as a wetland or not. There are some wetland indicator species here. But that's something I'm going to have to look up of whether or not it's actually classified as a wetland. And the next thing you're going to do is a site sketch. So I'm not going to sketch it right now because I'm not a very good artist. And you don't have to be a very good artist to do this. But basically you want to include anything that you're seeing. So you want to show how the stream meanders. Um, I guess I'm going to show you. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> okay. So we're going to sketch out our 100 meter stretch. So we're going to start up there um, right before that little pool. Um, that's where our 100 meter stretch would start. So I'm just going to include it just so that we, you know, so there's a bridge right here. with two openings and the stream is flowing out of it. And it meets right here, we have a little pool. And it narrows down and the stream kind of curves around, splits again, comes around. We have another little pool here. They meet up. And it goes down to another pool down there. So in this area, we have grasses or sedges rather in here. We have lots of boulders all over the place. Some big boulders. We have trees. Told you, I am not an artist. Lots of sedges all the way around on this bank. This bank, there is some vegetation hanging over. And then there's a little bit of a runoff area from the road that enters in here. Um, we entered for our stream assessment right here and we walked in the stream here and up. Um, and I'm gonna mark off our sampling location. So we're gonna sample right up here at the top of the pool. So right here, before it splits, there's another great riffle and I'll show you what that looks like. And then down here, when they come back together, there's some more riffles down here. So a riffle is an area like this right here where you see this water flowing quickly um, and it's kind of coming over these rocks and what a riffle generally has is an area in the water with a lot of oxygen. Um, oxygen is really important for everybody, especially aquatic uh, macro invertebrates. So we're gonna target riffles when we're using um, our DNET to sample. So um, I will show you what that looks like. So I'm going to start kicking up right here and you really want to get your feet on the ground. They call it the macro shuffle where you shuffle your feet. You want to turn up that substrate and you're doing it right into your D-net. The water flows off in the area that you're working in and flows into your D-net. Disturb all those benthic, so bottom dwelling macroinvertebrates, aquatic macroinvertebrates, and get them to go into your D net. So once you shuffle around for about a minute, picking things up, then generally you'd have two people. So one person would hold the D net, and the other person would wash the rocks.
There's lots of clingers. that like to hang out on these rocks, so I'm trying to wash them off with my hands and have them go into my neck. that I can show you. I've already washed them all in. Let's see. Oh, there's a water penny right there. It's hard to see. Let me hold my net up. It's a sign of really healthy stream. Water pennies are pollution intolerant. Great thing to find. Right. We're going to go rinse this out in our sieve net and then keep doing a few more samples. Another stone fly. Hello, my friends. Water honey. Lots of water pennies. Hello. Oh, another stone fly on my finger. All right. So we're going to do our subsampling. So it's gonna take way too long to try to sample everything in the bucket that we collected. So what we do is a subsample. And what that means is that we take a scoop of what's in there. We wanna make sure the only things that we're getting in there are benthic macroinvertebrates. So even right now when I'm looking, I can see some water striders and they are not benthic macroinvertebrates because they're not benthic. They don't live on the ground. There are also some little minnows in there and they are not benthic aquatic macroinvertebrates because they have a backbone. Okay, so we're looking at invertebrates. So if you happen to get one of those, you've got to put it back. We are not looking for them. Whoa, <laughs> on that scoop, we got, you can see, in there a crawfish which is a benthic macro invertebrate um, but they are too big to be in any of my containers right now so I'm just gonna leave it in there um, and so we're gonna start sorting out the other things that are in there so let's see there is a water penny right here I'm gonna scoop that out and put it in my tray Right there. So there's too much water. Okay, let's see what else is in this scoop. Whoop, a little mayfly. Come here, mayfly, my friend. Whoop. Mayflies. You can tell what they are. They have the three little tails. Um, and if you're not really familiar with your macros, you can use a dichotomous key. That's what I have right here. We have two on our website, the Stroud uh, Water Research Center one, which is really, really great. And we have another one here too. And basically I'd use a dichotomous key is a yes or no answer. So let's work, work through this. We can even work through it with our crawfish. So if you're looking at it, the first question is, does it have a shell or no shells? So with our yes or no answer for our crawfish, it has no shell. Then the next thing it says is, does it have legs or no legs? And if you look at our crawfish, it definitely has legs. So let's go down here. And then the next thing it's going to ask is, does it have 10 plus pairs of legs 
or does it have three pairs of legs? So we have one, two, three, four, five pairs of legs. So, sorry, not 10 pairs, 10 plus legs. So if it has five pairs of legs, it has 10 legs. And so is it lobster-like, shrimp-like, swims on its side, or walks on the bottom? And so that's definitely lobster-like. Look at those claws. I can pick it up without it pincing me. Ah! So that's definitely lobster-like, and that's a crawfish. So that's how we use our dichotomous key. So we can go through it for our um, little mayfly too. So shells or no shells, there is no shells. Does it have legs or no legs? It definitely has little tiny legs if you look at it. And if you have a hard time seeing it, we can use our macro lens or our loop lens. So let's put it in this little dish here. So let me scoop you out. Come on. You don't want to play nice. Let's dump it in then. Okay. Give it a little bit more water. Okay. So we can use our loop lens if we want. And so when you use your loop lens, you don't need to put it up to your eye. You can actually hold it down near the organism and then I can see it really, really well. So we can also use this macro lens and put a white background down. It's a little bit easier to see. And you can use that to mag magnify. And so that's really helpful. I see a lot of people using their loop lens and they're putting it here and they're trying to get it really, really, really close. Um, but I find it works really well for me. Um, just putting it close and then looking around. So let's get back to our dichotomous key. So legs or no legs, it definitely has legs. Does it have 10 legs or three pairs of legs? And we look at it using our little magnifying glass and it has three pairs of legs. So three pairs of legs. Does it have wings or no wings? And there are no wings on it. So we come down. Are there no obvious tails? One or two tails or three tails? And so using our lens, we can look and it has three tails right on the end of its body. So we're gonna go over here. So there's mayfly larva that look like this. Mayfly larva looks like this. It has long tails and gills in the abdomen. This has long tails and gills in the abdomen. There's um, also damselfly larva has uh, plate-like tails and no gills in the abdomen. So let's look and take a close look. And sometimes you can see the gills moving. So that has gills along the abdomen. They're really hard to see unless you use your loop lens. But they are there and they're moving like this, helping it breathe so we know that this is a mayfly larva. All right, so the last thing that you're gonna do before you leave is decontaminate. So we have Alcanox powder, uh, which is a biodegradable uh, decontaminant. And so you're gonna fill a bucket up with water and you're gonna add some Alcanox to it. And then you're gonna scrub down everything that got in contact with stream water. So your waders, your D-net, your sieve bucket, any of your sampling equipment, um, like our sorting buckets, 
your rubber decky or ball, anything that got in contact with the water because you don't want to bring anything from stream to stream. So there could be um, some invasive snails that are in there, or there could be dynamo, which is also called rock snot. Um, and you don't want to bring that between your stream sessions. So make sure that you decontaminate, so you fill your bucket up with water, add some alkanox, get your boots in there, scrub it down really well, scrub everything down, um, and then you can dump the bucket with alkanox. Just don't dump it into the stream. Go uh, upland a little bit, and you can dump it there. And um, just make sure that everything is clean because we don't want to contaminate and spread things from one area to another. Thanks so much.